Well, good morning, everybody. I was just thinking as we were singing, you know, one of the uh, greatest weapons in the arsenal of the early reformers, and one of the reasons they were considered such a great threat in that time was that they were able to put their theology into the heads and the hearts of the young people. They were able to pass it on from generation to generation. And how wonderful it is on Reformation Sunday to, to see this wondrous legacy even before our eyes, to see that the, the word is going out not just, you know, geographically, but generationally, from generation to generation. So thank you, young people, for, for leading us today. If you take your Bibles as we continue on in our series in Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 4, verse 7, over the next two Sundays, we'll be exploring these, these very important verses, not just in the book of Galatians, but in the life of the church. You know, even as we hear the gospel week to week, and even as we sing about it week to week, I think we still have a natural tendency to view the gospel as inherently foolish and the law as inherently wise. This is what we're going to be thinking about today as we come to Galatians 3, verse 23. Here now the reading of God's word. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. If you abide in his word, you are truly his disciples. And you will know the truth. And this truth will set you free. Let's pray. Father, we pray today that we would understand the freedom that we have in the gospel, freedom that came at such a high price so long ago by he who was born of a woman, born under the law. Father, even as we have this lure to always go back, even as we are charmed by the things that make most sense to us in this world, We pray, Lord, that we would hear the call of Christ, that we would heed that call, that we would go forward, that we would go to Him, that we would rest in Him, in the reality, in the sanity that He gives us at His right hand. Lord, we pray these things as we hear Your Word today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amidst the mounting pressures of adulting, feeling overworked and underappreciated, as adults, we sometimes find ourselves thinking about simpler days, don't we? We get nostalgic. 
for good old days. The days when all of our needs were cared for. When we didn't have to worry about bills and deadlines, caring for other humans. The bygone glory days when play was the norm and work was the interruption, not vice versa. When things came easy, when we were less tired, less bitter, when we didn't have to worry about our next meal because mom or dad always made it. Even as I describe it, maybe some of you are like, yeah, I do kind of miss those times. You know, it's interesting that we seem to find this kind of childhood allure, even in the Bible, on a spiritual level. The Puritans called it spiritual declension. I mean, how many of the biblical stories are about essentially this? God essentially pushing his people forward. The eschatological clock is ticking along, and yet God's people want to go back. Again and again, they want to go back to Egypt, back to the simpler days when they didn't have to worry about three meals a day and trying to squeeze water out of a rock. I mean, sure, they were in bondage, but it was more comfortable in a way. Back to Egypt, back to their idols, back to the Asherahs and the Baals, like a parent trying to to uh, navigate their toddler through a crowd, a very familiar scenario to some of us, and the toddler is always wandering, getting distracted by the, the shiny, sparkly this and that. Like that parent, there was God trying to lead us along, and we were that toddler backsliding again and again and again. Remember that rebuke in Hosea chapter 11 when God makes this very comparison that I just made. When Israel was a child, I loved him. But the more they were called, the more they went away. My people are bent on turning away from me, he says. Remember this kind of thing defined so much of the ministry of Jesus. Here was the long-expected Jesus, born at God's appointed time, saying, Hey, everybody, the fullness of time has come. Here I am, your long-awaited Messiah. And the religious experts responded, No, thank you. Oh, the good old days of youth. The days of Moses and David and the prophets. Those were the good times. Those were the golden years we want to hold on to. Not what you're offering. Congregation, this was the church in Galatia. God was telling his church, a new age has dawned. The fullness of time has come. The mystery of the gospel has been revealed. But the Galatians wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to the, the vaunted glories of Moses. They were like Israel, you know, just days after, after crossing the Red Sea. God, you want us to move forward, but we want to move back the way we came. Back to the day when life was great. When we didn't have to bother about living by faith. But what Paul says throughout this letter is that Galatia, your rosy take on the past is skewed. Those glory days, as you called them, were days of bondage. Yes, those days existed for a time and for an important purpose. It was fitting for the church in her adolescence, but it was basically slavery. It was burdensome and never meant to last. And now the church has grown up. The time has come. The church has come of age. You've been freed. You've been made a full heir of God's family estate as his adopted child. So don't long for the past. Look to what's ahead. 
brothers and sisters, we all have this tendency. This didn't die with Galatia. This, this knee-jerk urge that we have to backslide, to go back under the law, to be lured away by the sweet siren song of Moses is very, very strong. Stronger than we think. The voice of the law often seems far wiser than the voice of the gospel. When I was a kid, we'd often have slide night at our house. And we had lots of pictures on slides back then. You guys remember slides? Slide projectors? On certain nights, we would... Uh, load the reel of slides into the projector. We'd throw a sheet up on the wall. We'd turn off all the lights. We'd, you know, uh, make some popcorn, and, and we'd scroll through family photos, remembering, remembering the days gone by. Well, Paul is basically doing the same thing with us over the next two Sundays. He's, he's pulling out uh, the slide projector, and he's showing us pictures of what the church was like in her adolescence, in her growing up years, and now in her adulthood. And in doing so, in displaying how far we've come, he's demonstrating why the gospel is worth holding on to. And why it is so foolish to want to go back. This morning we're going to consider three different snapshots of the church Three different glimpses of the church as it relates to the law. There's, number one, the church in her adolescence, the law as a guardian. The church in her weakness, the law as a charmer. And number three, the church come of age, the law as fulfilled. So first of all, the church in her adolescence. Uh, verse 23, now before faith came... We were detained under law, restricted until the coming faith would be revealed. Now, as we get started here, it's important to understand that Paul is distinguishing between two ages of the church here. There's the church in her adolescent form, the age of the law, the age prior to the coming of Jesus. And there's the church in her adult form, the age of faith, he calls it, the age in which Jesus has come. You see, as Christians, we don't think of time the way that others do. We're not just floating about aimlessly on the sea of history, gently bobbing from place to place, no destination, no beginning, no end. The journey is the destination. No, we believe that our Creator made us for a particular purpose and that He is leading history forward until that history is realized. History is heading toward a telos, a goal. It's not an endless cycle governed by the stars and the planets. Round and around we go. It's not uh, what we make of it. Well, everyone around me is just part of my life movie. No, history is a cosmic love story with a beginning and a middle and a climax and an end. And in this love story, like most love stories, there's a progression. The climax doesn't happen in the first chapter or even in the first book. No, it takes time for the story to, to build. There's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of story development that takes place. Well, that's what was going on in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there in early Genesis, we see the church in her infancy. We see the people of God begin to take shape. And as time marches on into the days of Moses, we see the church in her adolescence, she's a growing child. And like any child, she needed a lot of close parenting. A lot of restrictions. 
a lot of boundaries and limitations. Like most kids, their lives were defined by rules and regulations, rewards and punishments. Do this. Don't do this. Paul says that in the age of the law, the church was detained. She was under guard. She was restricted until the coming faith was revealed. In other words, every moment of life, what to eat, what to wear, was carefully managed for them. Now Paul explains this a bit more in verse 24. He says that the law was our guardian until Christ came. And jumping ahead to verse 2, he says that we were like a wealthy man's son growing up under guardians and managers until the time designated by our father. Now, to really understand where Paul's coming from here, we need to know something about child-rearing back in the ancient world. Uh, back in Paul's day, when a child was born into a wealthy family, that child would essentially be raised by a guardian. Literally a pedagogue. Think of it like a full-time nanny. The guardian, who would usually be uh, an older slave hired by the father, would supervise this child's upbringing. He would accompany the child on the walk to school, protecting him from, from bullies. He would supervise his education, making sure he did his homework. He would supervise his conduct, even disciplining the child when he stepped out of line. Uh, so this, this guardian, essentially, as Paul Riken put it, Phil Riken, was part babysitter, part chaperone, part tutor, part probation officer. Now for you kids grimacing, oh wow, that would be the worst way to possibly grow up. Keep in mind, the guardian served a very, very important purpose in the life of that child. In fact, often the two would develop a very close emotional bond because they spent a lot of time together. That guardian lived for that child, for, that, for their welfare, for their good, their preparation for adulthood. Well, that's basically what Moses and the law was for when the church was underage. The law was appointed by God to be our guardian, our manager, our full-time nanny, to prepare us for adulthood. And like the ancient guardians, the law served a dual purpose, both positive and negative. First of all, positive. What positive purpose did the guardians serve? Well, it's interesting that the same word that Paul uses in verse 23, he uses in Philippians 4.7, the famous words, and the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, guarding isn't always a bad thing. Guards are called to protect, to shield from harm. Well, that's what the law was. It served to protect God's people, to guard them from temptation, from the harmful influences of the surrounding nations. It was a hedge against evil. Think of the, uh, you know, that two-inch plexiglass that separates you from that hungry lion at the zoo. Well, that barrier not only protects you from the lion, but the lion from you. It keeps you out. Well, the same with the law of Moses. It, it kept the influence of the nations out. And not only that, but it taught Israel many things. Uh, the law taught them about God. It taught them about His ways, His goodness, His holiness. It laid out the path of righteousness for them to walk on and commune with God. In fact, it, it was their greatest delight. This is why the psalmist says, 
Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And yet most importantly, the law taught them about Jesus. Every time they laid that sacrifice on the altar, they were taught about the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world. Every time they sang Psalm 24 in synagogue, they would think of the King of glory soon to come. The law had a positive purpose. It also had a negative purpose. The thing is, a cage is still a cage. Even if it does a lot of good. Beloved, Israel was bound. They were, as Paul says, imprisoned under Moses. That's the reality. The rules and the regulations, the obligations, the punishments. All 613 commands they had to follow to the letter. And it's not like the law was effectual because it wasn't. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about, remember? How the law could never actually provide what it demanded. You see, the thing about a cage is that it doesn't change the nature of the beast. It cages the beast. It prevents the beast from getting out and spectators from getting in. But the beast is still a ferocious carnivore. The cage can't change that. Well, that's like the law. The law works as a nice hedge. It helps modify our behavior, but it can't change the heart. I'm always struck by that opening recitation that Joel Osteen and his congregants chant at the beginning of his sermons. I saw it again the other day. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I tell that to Martin Luther. Where the generations of Israelites just grinded into the ground by a law that they could not keep. Now, to be fair, that's what the rich young ruler believed. He believed that he could do what the law demanded. He came to Jesus believing that he had it all. He says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, he doesn't even bother to wonder if he can earn eternal life. He, he knows he has the power. He just wants the list of commands so he can check it all off. Like a business transaction. And so Jesus gives it to him. He gives him a sampling of the Ten Commandments. And the man says, oh, great. I have actually already done all of those things. This works out very nicely. Is there anything else? Jesus says, yeah, go and sell your possessions and follow me. And the man says, oh, never mind. And he walks away. See what Jesus is saying here? Far from telling this man that he is able to earn heaven, he's actually exposing to him his laughable inability. He's exposing the fact that this man, like all men, have a severe heart problem. A problem that all of his rigorous, T-crossing, I-dotting, law-keeping could not fix. So the problem with the Galatians was not only that they were backsliding, they were pining for the glory days of their adolescence, but that those glory days weren't glory days at all. That's Paul's point. They were longing for something that wasn't freeing, but binding. Something that was imperfect and ineffective. Something that was designed to pass away. Now we do this too. This problem didn't expire with Galatia. Throughout her history, and even today, even here in 2022 Las Cruces, we have a strong tendency to want to go back into bondage. 
letting the law, the things of adolescence, define us instead of the gospel. How so? Well, I think it's worth spending a few minutes exploring. This leads to our next point. The church, in her weakness, the law as a charmer. Now, the fact is, from the moment that we awake each day, brothers and sisters, to the moment we lie down, you and I are under the regime of the law. Think about it. Obligations. Deadlines. Status. Like Daniel talked about last week, the, the crushing meritocracy. We live our lives under the banner of do this, achieve this, buy this, look like this, and you will live. From the moment we awake in bed and then reach over to grab our phones, checking our emails and texts, tallying how many likes and shares our social media posts are getting, thinking about all that lies ahead of us that day, the deadlines at work, picking up and dropping off the kids, getting something fixed, doing some project around the house, just the frenzy of stuff that needs to be done. From the moment that we open our eyes each day and return to bed at night, our lives are lived under the boot of a checklist, a law that we must keep. Even sleep itself is often singed with the law. Isn't that amazing? I was thinking about that. Dreams, at least for me, dreams, nightmares about our inadequacy, fears that we haven't overcome, puzzles unsolved, pain unhealed. It's hardwired into our thinking as fallen image bearers that obligations, duties, responsibilities, successes, and failures, this is life, and there is literally nothing beyond that. Paul has a name for this. He calls it, verse 3, the Stoicheia 2 Cosmos, the elementary principles of the world. The elemental spirits of the world. It's the basic ABC principles, the nuts and bolts of how you and I think the world works. In other words, you are inclined to think this way. I am inclined to think this way by default. That the law is all wise and the gospel is all foolish. Now, what are some concrete ways that we, that we do this, that we think this way? How do we act on these inclinations, these, these elementary principles instead of the gospel? Well, first of all, we treat the law as if it is the gospel. We try to wield the law as if it is the real power of God to salvation. And the thing that actually does change the heart. In our child rearing, for example, we think, well, as long as I have enough hedges in place, as long as I have enough boundaries and restrictions and good habits, then my child is going to turn out right. As long as I'm the disciplinarian I need to be, and as long as, as my child follows this plan, then he or she will surely love Jesus. Now, are boundaries and restrictions good and necessary things? Sure. But we have to realize the limitations. We do this in marriage, too. Well, as long as we follow these regiments, as long as we take these vacations and date nights, as long as we follow this plan step by step, then we'll have a marriage that is good and healthy and successful in the eyes of God. But we forget, again, the fence can cage the beast, but it can't change it. 
Only the gospel can do that. Only the power and presence of Christ, His love, His embrace, His forgiveness, the fact that I and my spouse and my children are powerless sinners saved by a greater Savior, only when that groundbreaking reality filters into our relationships and our expectations and our goals can Christ be formed within. And until we realize that, as Spurgeon put it, it's like preaching to crab trees, telling them to bear pears and apples. Nothing's going to happen. Charles Spurgeon once lamented, I was reading it this last week, he lamented how so many children are taught morality as the gospel. He said that so many children are basically taught this. Now, dear children, be very good and obey your parents and love Jesus and you will be saved. That is not the gospel and it is not true. The root of the matter is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That is the gospel for a child of two years of age and the gospel for a man of a hundred. Another way we go back under the law, guilt tripping ourselves and others. We let the guilt of our sin or others' sins be the lens through which we view ourselves and the world around us. We let past hurts, regrets, abuses, or just our own failures shape our responses, our perspectives. In other words, we're creatures of shame. We keep the record of others' wrongs always at hand. We look at others and all we see is a bunch of people who've hurt us. And meanwhile, we look at ourselves and all we see is a sinner a failure, a miserable good-for-nothing, someone who doesn't deserve happiness. Just self-loathing. This is a way we go back under the law, brothers and sisters, because as we live this way, as I live this way, we're living as if the gospel never happened. As if Jesus never carried that cross to Calvary and said, it is finished. Rather, we think, I have to carry that cross. I have to bear that shame. I have to wear that crown of thorns. Or if not me, you. You have to carry that cross. You have to bear that shame. One more way we go back under the law. Ignoring the law. Now you might be thinking, how does ignoring the law place us back under the law? Well, because you can't really ever completely ignore the law. You can try. You can try to suppress it. Avoid it. But it leaves a vacuum. If you don't submit to God's law, you'll just replace it with a new law. One of your own making. Doesn't that just define our times? We've put God's law out to pasture. We've shouted, God is dead. And what's happened as a result? We've replaced God's law with laws of our own. Sacrosanct, highly policed laws of what you can say, what you can think, the very meaning of certain words, laws that you dare not transgress or you will be shunned. We follow an ever-evolving code of ethics, and we are merciless in its enforcement. We are ruthless in ensuring that everyone toes the line. But this is nothing new. A generation ago, it was something else. I mean, look at those in Jesus' day. How many extra-biblical rituals and traditions was Jesus expected to follow 
to a T simply because the religious figureheads of the day said he should. How many times was Jesus standing against a confused mob because he defied their made-up laws and customs? Oh, the charm of the law. We always want to go back into bondage when God is ushering us forward into freedom. Friends, the good news today is that we've come of age. We're no longer bound under the reign of the law. That age has passed and a new age has come. That's our final snapshot of the church we're going to look at. The church in her adolescence, the church in her weakness, and finally, the church come of age. So Paul's point in these verses is this. The law was needed as our nanny but only for a time. It was never meant to last forever any more than childhood was meant to last forever. No, it had a built-in expiration date. And truth be told, in Jesus, the great fulfiller of the law, that expiration date has come. That old guardian is no longer needed. Why? Because in the gospel, in Jesus coming under the law to fulfill the law, the law now stands fulfilled for us all. And therefore, as the writer of Hebrews says, it is now, quote, obsolete and fading away. That's how we're supposed to think about the Mosaic Law, according to Hebrews. It's obsolete and fading away. Its nannyship is done. As Paul says, verse 25, with the coming of faith, we are no longer under a guardian. You see, now that Jesus has come, everything has changed. Everything. Who we are in relation to God has changed. Look at verse 26. For all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, despite what those elementary principles tell you, You're not the sum total of what you do or achieve. Rather, Christ defines you. Christ is your life, his merit, his righteousness, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection and ascension. That is now your life. Who you are is hidden with Christ. If there's anything you could put on your tombstone, the truest thing you could ever engrave to sum up your life, it's this. Here lies so-and-so hidden with Christ. You see, Christian, this is what baptism is all about. To be baptized into Christ signifies that you are dead to everything that you think makes you acceptable to God. Everything you think makes you worthy of his sonship. Everything you assume makes you a stand-up person before the Lord. All your striving, all of your attempts at, at earning your father's smile, at your baptism, all that was renounced as dead. It was nailed to Jesus' cross, and it was buried in his tomb. And now you are someone hidden with Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Which means that not your merits, but his merits define you. Everything he earned is yours, including sonship. We'll unpack that more next week, what that sonship means. Who we are in relation to God has changed. Who we are in relation to others has changed too. Verse 28, we'll wrap things up here. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now remember, nothing polarized the peoples of the ancient world more than race, rank, and sex. 
those ethnic barriers, class barriers, gender barriers, those literally dictated your place in society and religion. Those held up the world in which they lived. Well, part of being baptized into Christ means that as far as God is concerned, as far as the communion of saints is concerned, those barriers are also now dead. They've been buried with Christ. And according to Paul, to resurrect those, those barriers, to let those demographics, whether it's race or rank or gender, trump our unity in the faith or our oneness with Christ is to deny the faith altogether. It's to deny our baptism. It's to renounce the one in whom we are baptized and effectively turn back the eschatological clock, taking the church back under the guardian, back under the law. You see, when it comes to your standing before God and your brothers and sisters and their standing before you, when it comes to your acceptance of them, how you feel about them, how much you embrace them, there's really only one thing you need to think about. Are they hidden with Christ or not? Are they baptized into the name of Christ Jesus? Or aren't they? That's the question I'll leave you with today. We'll pick things up from here next week. Whether this is your first sermon you've ever heard or your 10,000th sermon, I ask, are you in Christ or not? Are you a son of God? Along with Christ, your elder brother, sharing in all the riches of sonship, all the assets and blessings of your father's estate as one who's come of age? Have you, have you taken hold yet of what Christ bled to give you? Or are you still striving? Are you still slaving away under the law? Trying to build that tower of Babel brick by brick. Bound by those elementary principles that holds the whole world in bondage. When you rise each day, when you go to sleep each night, do you do so knowing, believing, trusting, resting, celebrating that all that is Christ's is now yours? That every care, every need in heaven and on earth has been met for you? That what the law could not do, the gospel has done. Do you believe that? Do you rest in that? I pray that you do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray that we would know that freedom. We pray, Lord, that we would know that rest in a world of hurry, in this fast-paced, frenetic mess that we find ourselves each day, feeling overworked, underappreciated. Lord, we pray that we would come to the place of rest that you give us, knowing that all that we have, all that we desire has been met in Christ. That we are those who are hidden with Christ, and there's nothing that can undo that. Neither heaven nor hell, neither things above or things below, neither life nor death. Oh, Lord. We pray that we would know the blessing that is found at your right hand, that we would embrace those things, that we would own those things, that we would not be duped by that luring voice of the law trying to go back into bondage. Oh, Lord, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.